Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. Thanks for being here. So I just finished a, an entire series on self-publishing and at the end of it I did an episode on audiobooks and I promised that I would dive into creating audiobook, audiobooks as an author. So this is the first video in that series. So subscribe, hit the notification bell so that you can follow along with the rest of the series. Today we're just diving into kind of the introduction, how you need to get set up if you are interested in doing your own narration. So there are plenty of options to pay. You may not feel comfortable. Maybe this is something you want to get into, so you want to try it with your own books first. Maybe you are trying to jump in to do some royalty-free audiobooks on ACX Audible. Whatever it is, if you're just jumping in, this series will be helpful to you. Basically, I'm taking what I've learned and condensing it so that you can start ahead of where I started. Start where I am now instead of where I started. So, first of all, I've been a performer my entire life. Singer, dancer, actor. So I was very comfortable jumping into the role of audiobook narrator, but it is very different than those other things. It's different than being on stage. So you have to realize that. Are you comfortable performing your book or will someone else do a better job than you? You have to really think about that before you make that decision. No one's going to listen to someone who is monotone or boring or can't breathe life into the audiobook. So is that you? Probably the biggest consideration authors have in deciding whether to do it themselves or not is money. Let's just be honest about it. The only real program out there that allows you to get an audiobook made for, for free up front is ACX or Audible in their royalty share program. So you can do that. But you need to realize that the people auditioning for your work to do a royalty share aren't the pros. They're not people with a lot of experience or a lot of books under their belt. Otherwise, they wouldn't be willing to work for free. Because in all reality, unless for some reason your book like goes crazy and becomes a bestseller, most royalty share agreements, the narrator is never going to make that money back. So they're essentially working for pennies for the opportunity to have their name on a book and to start get reviews. And the more they can build their name and their reputation, the more jobs they can get. So you're taking advantage of that fact to get your book produced. You're basically granting them that note on their CV or that credit in exchange for letting them do your book. Yeah, you're splitting your, your royalties, but they're really not going to be that much. So don't think because you're doing it on ACX for a royalty share that you're getting better quality than potentially you could do yourself if it's something you are interested in doing and you feel like you have the capacity, the chops, to bring your story to life. There's no reason why you can't just do it yourself for free, and that way you won't be limited to just ACX for seven years. You'll be able to do expanded distribution. You'll be able to direct sell. You'll be able to do all the things you can't do when you do a royalty agreement on Audible. So let's first dive into your setup. You first need a good studio, a space. You want that space to be as acoustically dead as possible. So a lot of people think at first that you want some a room with these great acoustics or what you consider a great acoustics which is generally people think are a live room, like a bathroom or a kitchen. You want the opposite. You want a room where there's no echo, where essentially the sound, once it comes out of your mouth, kind of dies in the room. If you look at professional narrators or, or sound studios, they have booths that are soundproof, and they're full of acoustical tiles or padding. You see a lot of them that looks like egg cartons. I have mine here I'll talk about in a second. But that's because you want you don't want any ambient noise. You only want your microphone picking up what's coming out of your mouth, not what's bouncing off the walls. So where can you find a spot like that in your house? For me, I have a basement office, which is good because up to about four feet, I'm just surrounded by dirt. I'm underneath the ground level. So that's good insulation. I have one small window 
And I have filled that window well with foam, so about four to five inches of foam. And then I hung a full wall, ceiling to floor, blackout, thick blackout curtain on top of that. So that not only blocks a lot of sound from coming in through that window, it also deadens any sound inside. I also have a closet because it used to be a bedroom. But instead of having a sliding closet door or a glass closet door, I hung curtains. Again, heavy blackout curtains in order to eat that sound, eat those echoes. You also want a carpeted room. And then you can... So what I did, and there's another video, I'll put it in the same playlist. I built a portable sound wall with foam that when I'm doing audiobooks, I put it directly behind me. So that's all you'd be able to see. For now, I just have it up where you can, so I could show it to you. But I have a video about how I made it. I can take it apart and put it in my closet when I'm not doing audio so that it's not taking up my entire office. But this foam padding, padding is something else that deadens sound, which is what you're going for. You can also get 12 by 12 or 24 by 24 acoustical tiles or pads that you can put on the ceiling. And you don't need to cover the ceiling. You can, a lot of people just put a kind of a pattern or checkerboard or whatever. You can, a few, the, the more you have, the more dead your sound is going to be, but you at least want a few to stop some of the, those echoes, sound bouncing off of those flat surfaces. People put them on the walls as well. So what if you don't have a dedicated office space to use? A great place in your home to start is a walk-in closet. All of those clothes are made out of cloth and they will eat up your sound, just like the curtains or the, the panels. Most master closets are carpeted. If yours is not, you'll want to put down some thick rugs. A lot of them don't have a window. Again, if they do, you can do what I did with foam. And most of them have a door that you can shut, so you're in a small enclosed space. The smaller the space, the easier it is to control your sound. So you want to set that up. So I would recommend if you don't have another dedicated space, use a closet. And at the door, you can hang towels or clothes or a curtain or something when you close the door. So you're blocking off any sound coming through that door as well. So let me show you something else that I use. Okay, so this is just a little acoustical panel. And it's got acoustic foam here. And it folds up. So I use it when I'm narrating an audiobook. I'm, I didn't have it here now because it would block the camera, but I set it in front of my mic so that I'm speaking directly into these sound panels so that my voice isn't bouncing off my monitor. And so it just goes to the mic. Anything that goes behind the mic is just swallowed up by the sound panels. So this is something that then I could just take off the desk when I'm not narrating and put away, fold up and put away. Okay, so that's your setup. Next, let's talk about your equipment. You wanna have a decent mic. You can buy mics fairly cheaply now just because of the advent of YouTube and podcasting. They're a lot cheaper than they used to be. You can buy one that, that plugs into your computer directly through USB. I'm a musician, so I already had this mic and it's connected via XLR cable but you can't plug XLR into your computer, so I have to have a little mixer board. I have another video about the mixer board that I have. It's an A4, so a little four-channel mixer. They come under multiple brand names, but they're all the exact same mixer board, and you can check out my video on that. And it has some controls. It's got some volume functions, some highs, lows, gains, but I don't play with that much. I basically have just set it and leave it. So my mic goes via XLR cable into the little soundboard, which has a USB out into my computer. Really easy to use. You may ask, should I get a condenser mic or a, or a dynamic mic? Condensers will pick up more and probably get a truer sound. But if you're having a hard time finding a good quiet space, then dynamic might be the best option because it doesn't pick up as much ambient noise. It's not, uh, it doesn't, that pickup in a condenser mic is what gives a lot of good tone because it's picking up all of the the tones in your voice but again it's best in a quiet room a condenser mic also requires phantom power usually a lot of times that can 
if it's directly connected to USB, you're getting that power through your computer's USB port. I get it through my little soundboard has phantom power built into it. So works, works great. I prefer the condenser mic for the sound, but you do need a quiet room in order for that to work. You also need a good pop filter that filters out those kinds of sounds that would have been much more noticeable without the filter there. Let me give it a shot. Popcorn. Popcorn. And it blocks out some of the other sounds too. So you want a good pop filter. People ask, do you need a windscreen? Not really. If you have a good pop filter, the windscreen is for that. It's designed for wind. If you're outdoors, it's not going to hurt if you have one on there, but you don't need it indoors in a quiet space. Mic stand. You need a way for your mic to sit in front of you comfortably. I use this boom arm. I like it because it allows me to adjust the mic very easily and swing it out of the way when I'm done. So I just keep it permanently attached to my desk and just have it swung out of the way when I'm not recording. A mic stand I used for a while, then every time I'm done with it, I have to pick it up and move it out of the way and move it back in the way. It's It was just a little more annoying. So these are, and a lot of times you can get a set. If you buy a set, it might come with a shock mount holder, uh, which is a good idea. It prevents vibrations and stuff from going into your mic and creating sounds that you then have to edit out later. I'm waiting. The one I got with this set didn't fit this mic, so I'm waiting on a new one to come in. But that's another thing you can you can get just to make your setup better. The better your setup is to start with, the easier the, the post-production is, the easier the editing is. So, because you want to create a situation with the minimum amount of editing required and your initial product, your initial vocals to be the best they can be. So that's what you're trying to max maximize with your equipment. Now, your little lavalier mics aren't good. Your phone mic is not good. You need an actual microphone. Your little AirPods, not good quality. You need a good, deep, warm tone that picks up all of the different tonalities in your voice. And those little mics can't do that. All right, so that's a little bit on equipment. Let's talk technique a little bit. And these are some of the just tricks that I learned. First of all, right now I'm talking almost directly into the microphone. And my mouth is at the mic level. That's what I did for my first book. And I ended up spending a lot of time editing out little sounds, breath sounds, um, saliva sounds. So one of the ways to dampen that is the where you position your mic. First of all, saliva sounds that, sorry, <laughs> you don't want that, right? That's, ugh, that's not fun to listen to. You need to be very well hydrated. So it's okay to take breaks during your narration to drink. That's what helps that. A lot of people think you're getting saliva because there's liquid in your mouth, so they try not to, but it's actually when your mouth is dry, it creates more saliva. So you want to keep hydrated. And then maybe when you're editing or taking a break, sucking on a lozenge or hard candy or something will help. Okay, so positioning. What I found is that if I do this. So if I set my, you might notice my volume has changed a little bit because of mic placement. But if I set the mic at forehead level instead of mouth level, those breath sounds, the kind of spitting sounds, all those extra little sounds are carrying past the mic instead of right into the mic. So it, it lessens those sounds that you have to edit out later. Your volume goes down a little bit, but you can fix that easily in the software. That's easy to fix as a whole instead of having to fix every little breath sound. So this made a massive difference between my first book and my second book, just switching the mic to forehead level rather than mouth level. The next thing is breathing. We tend, your lungs are in your chest,
but you want to think stomach when you're doing an audiobook, when you're recording anything. So I want you to try that out now. When you breathe through your lungs, deep breaths, it makes a noise. But if instead of concentrating on breathing, in inhaling and exhaling, just concentrate on expanding your stomach and retracting your stomach, that will cause your diaphragm to move, which will allow your lungs to fill without making the sound. So I just took two full breaths, got the same amount of air as I got the last time, but you could hardly hear it. And it feels weird at first, but it's a trick singers use as well, breathing from your stomach. So you want your stomach to push out and in. You also want to, whether stand up or sit, if you're sitting, standing helps you have better posture, but not everyone has good posture even standing. So the important thing, whether you're standing or sitting, is that you, your back is arched, your shoulders are back, so that you have the maximum amount of air in your lungs. And when you just expand your stomach like that, it allows your lungs to fill with air without the noise. So let me bring the mic back down. Hopefully you could hear the difference there between the breathing. Just changing and focusing on that breathing technique, again, will save you buckets of time in editing. The next tool you need that's part of your technique is a little dog training clicker. And I can link to this in the description so basically what I do is if I'm reading, I'm narrating, and I make a mistake, and I have to go back and repeat a sentence, instead of having to repeat the entire chapter or page, you just hit that shows up in your recording software as a very distinct peak, and then go back, restart that sentence. That's all you need to restart. And then when you're editing, it's very easy to just go back and delete the first round, and add the second round. Super easy to do. This saves a lot of time editing because it, it turns your editing into a visual and an audio process. So your, your eyes and your ears are working together, which makes it a lot faster to edit. So invest in one of these clickers. You also need a good set of headphones or cans because when you are editing, you want to edit with the headphones on so that you hear everything. Most people are going to be listening in a car or maybe a gym where it's crowded and they can't really hear it, but you want the person that has the good headphones listening to the book not to be annoyed with breath sounds and lip smacking and all that stuff. So you need to edit it with good phones on. I'll leave a link in the description for the phones that I use that are a great price for the quality Yes, you can, but you can get much better at a much higher price, but at that medium price, this is probably the, the best quality for the best price. When I'm actually narrating, I take it off of one ear because these are noise canceling and your voice sounds very different in your head than it does in the room. So you want at least one ear open so that you can hear what your voice is sounding like in the room. Okay, what do you do if you need to cough, clear your throat, swallow, anything like that? You just finish your sentence, wait for a second, do what you need to do, hit your clicker, wait for a second, and then carry on. And then in editing, it's super easy to just go and delete that out. So let me show you real quick one good way to, to test your room noise, and then we'll be finished with this video. Okay, you see where that red line is moving at the left of the screen? Here, let me show you here. All right, see where this line is moving here? You can see me talking as it goes. And now I'm going to be quiet, and I want you to look at the, the kind of the heat signature on the bottom and notice what that looks like.
Okay, if you notice, there still is a little bit of pink down there, meaning there was some ambient noise in the room. That is a good thing. A lot of mistakes people make is they record their audio, and then in the editing process, they use a noise reduction to filter out all of the noise in the room, and they turn the, they take this section completely away. What that does is create true silence, which actually causes a ringing in your ears when you're listening. It's very annoying when you're listening. But you know that if this is all the noise you're getting, then you have a good setup. You have, you have good sound quality in your room with your mic. Now, this mic that I use, if I screw it in too tightly, it actually creates some noise that I can see visually here. And so I know before I even start recording that I need to loosen it up a little bit. Okay, so we've talked about your decision to narrate your own audiobook. We talked about your the room, how to set up the room. Again, there's a video on making this wall. There's also a video on the A4 mixer that I use in my channel. We talked about some of the equipment you need to make it easier. Kind of the setup and a few techniques that will make your life easier. In the next videos, we're going to actually get into recording and editing using free software. You can see from here, I'm using Adobe Audition, which I have access to, but it is very expensive. It's a big barrier to entry if you don't have the program. There are free programs out there, but you have to know what you're doing to make sure it sounds right. And you're way ahead of the game if you start out with good technique and good equipment. So I hope this was helpful to someone trying to get into it. I, I recognize if you are already a pro, this video probably wasn't for you, but hopefully even you may learn something. I always learn things even when it's something that I've done a lot. So please subscribe, hit the notification bell, and stay tuned for future videos in this series of creating and editing your own audiobook as an indie author.